Welcome to Musing with Tanya D. I am your host once again, Tanya D. And thanks for joining me in this podcast of the Nature Series. Um, Nature Series 109, I believe. Um, This podcast, I actually want to continue with the season of summer and the element of fire. But I'm going to talk about the relationship with fire to water and the male-female relationship. So when you think about the body, when you get too hot, you seek a lot of water, a cool shower, a cold lake, or a good balance for summer heat. And if you're like me and uh, have a pool, you know, that's my little go-to zone there. So water is the most yin receptive element. And it's the one that relates to our emotions. So in the body, blue the color for the water element actually balances out the red. So that's to say that fire and water control each other by keeping each other in balance. And they also can injure or even attack one another. So if your water energy is weak, then the fire can rage out of control and it leads to heat or inflammation in the body. But if the water becomes too strong, it can drown the fire and energy. So you might lose your power to act. And the relationship between the heart and the kidney is of vital importance in both Western and Chinese medicine. So in practice, fire and the water relationship correlates with the male fire and the female water The fire element relates to actually your sexual energy and it gives life and creative potential. So as the sun enables us to grow and blossom in nature, the water element relates to the bladder and the kidneys and rules the sexual organs and their function. Water receives and nourishes and it's also needed for growth. So when you uh, think about, I'm going to get all intimacy weird on you, I'm sorry. I'll apologize for anyone who, (laughs) sorry, I'm on a tangent. Uh, No worries. Um, So when you uh, think about um, sexual intercourse, having sex, so the male releases the fire, which is the semen, and it's made from the blood, and it's associated with that fire element. And from the water element, his kidneys and his sex organs, into the female who receives fire into her water element or her sexual organs in the womb. Normally, fire stimulates the water and the feelings to move. So a woman, if the energy of the emotions is not flowing well, or there's too much sexual activity for her, she might experience congestion of the energy of fire in the pelvic area and may suffer from inflammation or even an infection in her sexual organs. And uh, in men, too much sexual activity and not enough replenishing can mean that water takes control over a weakened fire, which can lead to congestion, backaches, lack of energy, lack of creativity. And it's not a joke. (laughs) We're really playing with fire here. So it's great to learn to understand and use the energy of fire and water clearly. So when love is full circle, giving and receiving all in one, the male, which is the Mars, in each of us is governed by the fire, yang, active and thrusting principle, while the female, Venus ruled, in us is ruled by the water, the yin, the passive, the receptive, the nature. We each contain both of these principles as they're really not separable. The relationship is more between the masculine and the feminine principles rather than men and women as separate individuals. So in the male-female relationship, the male or the fire stimulates the water or the feelings in the female who brings forth as love through the heart, giving nourishment and love back to the male. So the impulse in the relationship is to seek union, joy, and beyond this is to know oneself. However, seeking 
this kind of communion of spirit, which is a physical union with another, sometimes brings confusion and disenchantment. So both the physical bodies cannot occupy the same space, yet our soul essences or our spirits can merge and they all seem to be one. And the beauty, the contentment, along with the relaxation from this momentary experience can lead people to seek it all the time again through sexual activity. Eventually, we see that love is a feeling that arises from within us and it goes beyond counterdependence or people trading the satisfying of their needs with one another. Unattached love or giving it freely to others as well as to ourselves can help to understand the difference between love, a body-mind-spirit harmony and need, and emotional fulfillment. So, um, Stephanie, or sorry, Bethany Argyles um, states in her poem, Conditional Love, Karma, one of the laws of the universe relating to action, reaction, which causes the return of all things to their point of origin, is when we needed each other, love is when we need nothing. I think that's so cool. Um, So then, besides the male-female relationship and the energy, you also have, it's called the mother-son relationship or the law. So speaking of love... It's important to understand the relationship between the five elements. So, and this mother-son law is, it's the body's elements actually need to work together to maintain its fine-tuning. And you can see this clearly in the mother-son law or creation cycle. And the elements within the five elements form a circle in which one Being the mother actually gives energy to or creates the sun, and the sun receives the energy from the mother. So the cycle is described as fire creates earth, creates metal, creates water, creates wood, creates fire. So in the spring, the wood and the organs of the liver and the gallbladder give energy to summer's fire, the heart and the small intestine. Fire, in turn, creates earth energizing the spleen and the stomach. And if the mother element at this point is weak or unbalanced, it can cause the sun element to weaken in turn. Also, if the sun element is weak, it will demand more from the mother and weaken her. If the sun is congested or has too much energy, the energy can cause the mother in turn to back up and become congested. It's all interconnected in here and out there. And we have to keep our channels open and our energy flowing for it all to work properly. Um, So each season has uh, a mother and a son as well so that you need to maintain the balance of when you think about the physical elements in that manner. And so fire is also our intuition. It's like our kind of knowing, often called our sixth sense. Um, And it helps us to actually integrate our inner and outer worlds. It's an important process and it can be developed with practice. Like anything else, intuition has to do with insight, seeing within. It goes along with a receptive state like yin tuition. I like that. We let the feelings speak You don't have to be a meditator or even really spiritual, but you must allow the thinking mind to become aware of your feelings along with other inner senses for this particular knowledge, awareness, and knowing to emerge into your consciousness. So intuition is related to the sixth energy center or the sixth energy body or chakra and the area of the third eye and the penile gland. And it's an ancient light meter or it's a camera lens of consciousness and it opens and closes depending on how much light you can handle. Intuition is considered a highly main attribute of the element of fire 
And it seems to truly be a sense of the heart, but getting in touch with your intuition actually involves several of the elements. First, from metal or air element, relating to the lungs, you breathe and you allow your thinking mind and body to relax, where inspiration means the breathing in of spirit, and it has to do with being open to the new, the ideas, the air, the nourishment, and even the insights. And then you'll become aware of your feelings, which is water, and a flash of light or insight, fire will come into your awareness. And these sparks of realization can happen anywhere, anytime, if you are open to them. So whether you're sitting quietly all by yourself, or like sometimes I get my epiphanies driving down the road, but I don't listen, I mean, I don't turn the radio on in the car. I know I'm sure it makes other people crazy, but I really like to be aware and listen to the environment I'm in, the world around me, and be aware to everything. So um, for me, it's just the quietness, walking down the street, meeting your friends. These are all guidance that you get from your heart, and they can be helpful to guide you to your good or protect you from danger. So our hearts actually know the truth. And if we can learn how to listen to this information, we can answer questions, solve problems that we or even others might have. We just need to ask, then listen to what this inner knowing tells us. We t- need to find a fine-tuned balance between the heart and the mind. And it's really hard, but you shouldn't let either one of them take control of you either if you want to experience good health along with continual growth. Both have to actually work together. So you have to keep your mind open and clear. And remember too, as a spiritual teacher um, sings, listen, listen, listen to your heart. Um, I'm sure you guys all have this yoga book. It was Steve Jobs' favorite, but um, Yogananda. And yeah, I don't want to mess up his first name, so I'm not even going to say it, but that's where that came from. Also in the summer, we are just flying here. Um, How is your nutrition in the summer? Like what, you know, I think it's very vital to um, not just our bodies, but a healthy living style is to maintain your eating habits for based on the season you live in, as well as the season of the... um, earth plane in the environment. So somebody living in the cold all 24 seven obviously needs more meat. They're not going to have a lot of greens and vegetables, but it's the vibration of the earth plane there. And energetically, the body is used to that and it can sustain it differently. So I always kind of take that into consideration as well, based on the environment of the space where you're living in or the country or wherever you're at. But I, I, I still try to stick with my greens. I'm just crazy that way. But um, you'll notice in the summer, it's usually hot. And we're actually more active. And we need a diet that keeps us cool and light. So it's fortunate that nature will provide us with luscious, yummy fruits and vegetables at this time of year. Isn't it amazing? That's just the seasons. So you'll notice that gardens and orchards are really full. So in the summertime, it's actually better to keep with raw fruits and veggies, organically grown if you can, meaning without pesticides or other lovely chemicals, is actually ideal because it helps you feel lighter and it aids in weight loss along with keeping your energy strong. So I always like to remember fruits are cleansers and greens are nourishers. That's kind of my little go-to song. So... um. Foods that have a yin or a yang quality also. So fruits are the most yin. They're wet and they're cooling. Filed by vegetables where they are the yang foods or more concentrated heating ones. The proteins like uh, meat, nuts, seeds, beans, or fat, which is dairy products and eggs, and complex carbs, which are whole grains, 
which I stay away from, to be honest. Um, During the summer, I eat a plethora of fresh fruits, juices, multicolored fresh salads, vegetables, uh, almonds, probably sunflower seeds, not too many grains. um, And I try to stay away, honestly, from uh, dairies and meat, high meat. I just, I'm off the meat thing. Sorry if you guys, I'm not really vegetarian, but I'm really not a meat girl. So, um, in Chinese medicine, one of the guides to illness suggests that if an organ is unbalanced or overstressed in its season, the difficulty may be expressed in the following season. So what that means is if summer is not the time to overburden your liver, it's not in season. And the main detoxifier is the liver for your body. So you need to be careful with fried food, processed foods, chemical foods, Drugs of all kinds, especially alcohol, too much caffeine, because they all contain pollutants, which the liver has to deal with. So, however, if you happen to overdo it and have too much at a party to drink, and the next morning you can start your day with a helpful drink called a liver flush. And I actually do this randomly, to be honest. Um, Plus, I do lemon juice every morning anyway, but um, this is an awesome liver pr- flush. Um, I juice one to two lemons. I use a tablespoon of cold-pressed olive oil, two garlic cloves, and I like distilled water, but spring is recommended. And I throw it all in my blender, and I blend it for 30 seconds, and then I drink it really quick. And what's fascinating is um, if you don't, I literally will feel my liver heat up. It's, it's almost like it loves that sensation. And I wouldn't do it for a bunch, but yeah, it totally helps your liver if you have drank too much or you eat too much fried food or greasy stuff. Um, so, uh, like I said, I like that. But after you, um, it's an amazing tonic for your liver and a cleanser. So if you don't like garlic cloves, you can actually add um, some ginger root to it as well. And uh, the store by me actually has turmeric. But after you drink it, you need to relax or exercise for a bit. Then drink warm water or um, a seed tea. Seed tea meaning um, fennel, anise, or even fenugreek. And all you do with this is you add it to two cups of water and you let it simmer for 10 minutes in a glass ceramic pot um, on the stove, like in your teapot, and then let it sit for another 10 minutes before you drink it. And if you can, don't use aluminum cookware because it reacts with foods, introducing toxic levels of aluminum into the body. So um, this tea supposedly assists the action of the liver flush. It also acts as a relaxant and a gas reliever in the digestive system. So if you try this in another half hour, eat a light breakfast. So a light breakfast for you, if you're like feeling light, just have a couple pieces of fruit, fruit juice, juice, or tea in the morning, where a rich breakfast could include um, a small bowl of yogurt with some sliced pieces of fruit. I usually just eat a banana, sometimes an apple. Um, I snack on raisins or nuts. I love honey. Um, But it's important to not mix too many different foods together so you can get a better digestion and assimilation. And the less gas-fermented food in your system. But however, everyone's system is a little different. So you need to observe what actually works best for you. So if your body seems to let it can handle combinations more easily in a blended drink. There's a high energy drink, but you can make that's light and a breakfast that could take you through to lunch. So for one person, double the amounts for two, add together in a blender, two tablespoons of yogurt, a ripe banana, an apple or a pear and four ounces of apple or orange juice or just water. And you can also add one to two tablespoons of a really good tasting nutritional brewer's yeast because it's high in vitamin B and a tablespoon of olive oil, a tablespoon of molasses, blackstrap. 
It's high in iron and has a lot of vitamins. And the positive nutritional side of white sugar. You blend it all together, you drink it up, and you can vary the mixture for flavor and the consistency as you wish. And a more grounding and heat-producing breakfast, especially on a cold morning for a day of hard work, could be a bowl of natural dry cereal like granola or cooked one like oats, multigrain cereal. I like to snack on raisins, sunflower seeds, nuts. Topped with a little bit of raw milk, nothing taken out or added. That's what I mean by raw milk. And, or you can add some almond or coconut milk with toast, a cup of tea, maybe a glass of fresh orange juice. For proper food combining to prevent gas, drink 15 minutes before eating. And this will give you a good nourish feeling to actually start your day. And maybe you'll only have time for a Mr. Quickie, a cup of herbal tea with a slice or two of whole grain toast, spread it with a nut butter, top with some bananas or even some dates. Be sure to flush, brush your teeth, and before you rush out the door. Um, thanks for musing this podcast, continuing the element of fire in my nature series. Again, thanks for joining me. This is Tanya D, musing about fire. Talk to you soon. Thanks for liking, sharing, and loving my podcast.